Hi, guys. Um, for those of you who are here for the first session, a fantastically interesting and fascinating session. Just the same sort of rules apply as last time, which is basically we're going to start about 10 minutes behind, just let people sort of wander back from their lunches and have their, um, their piddles and their poo-poos and make sure they've had their caffeine and their nicotine and all of the other sort of vices that people need in order to survive these sorts of days. Um, so we'll be on about sort of 10 past, okay? Thank you. Okay, we're going to start a little bit ahead of schedule as opposed to behind, like we said before. So all this week on this stage, we have designed, um, between Weira and our good friends, what we hope is interesting, informative, illustrative, sort of no bullshit approach to the hard task of being an entrepreneur, whether that be, as this morning's session has indicated, building great products, understanding software development, task management, program management, marketing, or as in this session, one of the really key big problems that startups face, which is the cultural fit, which is hiring for people who actually get what your company's about, understand the value you're trying to offer, and really try to ensure that those early hires, which means so much, really do fit your team as well as possible. We have two fantastic founders here. We have Rich Martel, founder of Flox Media, and we have Robin Exton, founder of Datch. Now, both of these are Superbly talented, beautiful, young, interesting, dynamic humans Absolutely. who have probably <laughs> failed a lot, have probably <laughs> learnt a lot. Yeah. And I think over the next two hours, they're going to share some of those failures um, with you. And what we'd like is this morning we were all a bit flat, 
sort of in this, in this room. And we really want to make sure that we have quite a dynamic back and forth, lots of questions, lots of interactions. So if you do have thoughts, feelings, comments, you're just slightly uncomfortable, maybe you have an itch, please do put your hand up. Please do talk to us. We do really want to try and engage you in a meaningful way so you can learn as much as possible from these fantastic people. And for those of you who are unaware of what Wayra is, Wayra is one of the premier incubators in London. And those of you who attend all of the sessions that we're putting on this week, you will be eligible for a free pass to get interviewed for the Wayra Academy program. It's a fantastic program. Um, Robin's probably the best person to talk to really honestly and openly about it because she's actually been through it. Uh, <laughs> it's so it's Rich, I apologise, Richard. But I'm better than She's I'm definitely going to be better than that. But him. okay, we, Rich says still talk to Robin and that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll go along with that. But do talk to them about what it's actually like. You can also talk to Anne, who sat there. Mm. Anne, wave your hand. Uh, and you can also talk to me and we'll happily help and answer any questions. So without much further ado, let's find out what it takes to build a truly fantastic startup team. Okay, hello everyone. Um, as Ben said, we're going to make this slightly interactive. Um, we're not going to talk at you for two hours because that would probably be relatively unbearable. Um, but we're going to make this hopefully a useful session for you guys to tell you what we've done to build our teams um, and hopefully help you guys building yours. If you also, if you look bored or you fall asleep, <laughs> I will pick on you. You will look bored in a minute. <laughs> You've got to make sure you look more enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, don't look around. I will pick on you. There we go. It's going to be two hours of fun. <laughs> So who are we uh, to even have the right to stand here and talk to you? So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm uh, Ben Carney introducing you. My name is Rich Martel. <laughs> I uh, run a company called Flox, but my company at Wire is called Delishery. Um, and uh, my background came from, I, I studied computer science at UCL, which is a university just in London. And uh, my first experience with entrepreneurship came in my third year of uni, where I, I went, went into the library one day. I had an idea that I was going to set up a website based around spotting attractive girls in the library. I went home, went and built that in one evening, uh, put it online, and it spread. And in about four weeks, it spread from, from one university to 52 universities. It had a quarter of a million users in about four weeks. Uh, I ended up getting in a lot of shit with my university. Uh, kind of the same story as a social network, although I didn't start Facebook, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and, uh, but this is my, Delivery is my third startup. Um, I've had a, a bit of experience. I've probably hired close to 30 people, separate people at different times, maybe even more than that. I've lost count. Um, fired a fair few amount of those as well. Over to Robin. So I have a little bit less experience than Rich. Um, I started work at a branding agency, was doing the more corporate creative stuff. Um, I worked with the dating business for a while, thought it was really interesting, and then for some unknown reason decided to jack it all in and start my own startup. So I am the founder of Datch, which is a lesbian dating app. So kind of like the complete opposite of Grindr, so it's just for girls and it's more of a social network. Um, I have... Uh, made uh, a lot of mistakes in a very short period of time, including lots of really bad hires, bad freelancers and bad agencies. So I will be able to tell you a little bit about that, but now have a fantastic team that I have eventually managed to hire. So we'll try and tell you what I've learned so far from doing that part. So what are we doing today? Rich. So, yeah, we wanted to basically give you, and I know building a team is probably you kind of like, oh, wh how, where can you go wrong? Trust me. It's the biggest single place that you can fail in a startup is building the wrong kind of team or hiring the wrong people. A startup is based around the people that you work with. And if you don't choose the right people from the off, that's firstly choosing somebody you're gonna work with and go into business, that's a co-founder, um, then you're not gonna go very far. So we're gonna go into kind of how we get, get that kind of fit, what do we look for, uh, what kind of skill sets do we look for. Then obviously if that goes pretty well, you're gonna to look to wanna to bring on more people. You're not gonna be able to do everything yourself. So we'll look about hiring and the different options you have with that. And to be honest, things have changed in the last five, 10 years uh, in the way people do business. So we're gonna, we're gonna go through kind of the new ways of hiring. Come on, welcome, bring, bring more people, come on. <laughs> come on, you're late, it just, Jesus. Well, we're just getting into the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start from the start, just so these guys can catch Might up. as well, pad it out a bit more, yeah. no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, culture, obviously, one of the big reasons people work at a startup is because of the culture. Nobody wants to go and work at a boring bank or anything like that. So um, we're gonna talk about culture, what makes culture, cu culture important. Interns, interns are really important. I brought an intern along today, Sahil Wave. He's my intern. Uh, <laughs> I brought, that's him, you can go now. That's it, you don't need anymore. Um, 
and advisors. So we're going to go into all that in terms of how you can get interns and how you can get advisors and what you should really look for in that. Okay, so just to kind of precursor how we will be giving this talk to you. Hiring in terms of founders and getting a new team is a constant balance. You have this like dream of who your founding team member or the person you're going to hire is. And it's probably this amazing designer that has built the most beautiful apps that you've ever seen or this like ninja hacker that's going to be able to build your product for you collectively with you in the space of six weeks before you take over the world. And uh, the reality is, this is complete and utter bullshit because most of the time, whenever you're looking for a founder or you're hiring, you're feeling pretty desperate because either you have an idea that is really exciting that you really want to get going with, or you've lost someone from your team that you're having to add to it and you know they're going in four weeks and you don't have the money to get a recruiter and you don't have the time to find the right person. So you're constantly juggling between the kind of person that you know you really want to get that you think could be out there versus the really brutal reality of feeling pretty desperate and wanting to get someone into your team as quickly as possible. So what we'll try and do throughout the talk is try and give you tips on how to achieve the dream and the kind of best practice and ways to get those great people but also against the brutal reality of uh, trying to get the great people as quickly as you can for the money that you probably will have running a startup, which will probably be none. So, founders and friends, here is a core cool team structure. So, first of all, is any, like, can you put your hand up if you are currently running or looking to kick off a startup? That went to Lower plan. Than I thought. Okay. No, no, that went to plan. Yeah. I was, I was, I was, Good. I was, I was like, worried that. Fifty percent. <laughs> I was worried that no one's going to put their hand up. <laughs> so. And if the guys that did put your hands up, are you familiar? Like, have you heard of these terms at all before? Put your hand up if you have. Okay. Cool. So, but that's so. This is how every kind of startup team should be formed. It's kind of, it's the theory, it's what every investor is going to look for, it's what every accelerator is going to look for, and it's broken down into your hacker, your hustler, your hipster. So your hacker is your programmer. They're the person that's going to build you this fantastic product with technology that no one even imagined. Uh, the hustler is uh, my role, uh, which is the person that makes shit happen. So you're the business person. You're the person probably doing the sales. You're probably doing the boring stuff like the legal and the accountancy, probably doing a bit of marketing. You're kind of trying to move all the wheels to make it move forwards. Um, and the hipster is the one that they kind of shoehorned in to put an H in front of it, but is really just your designer um, who's going to create you a beautiful product. And more commonly in startup teams at the moment, it's probably a front end dev as well. So from that, seeing as we already know who you are, is there anyone here that's actually actively looking to meet people like uh, at the moment who's looking to create their startup team and is looking to find other people? Okay, cool. That's good. So we have a real, that was us that said that. <laughs> uh, we have an exercise to get stuff going. So if you're not like, looking to kick off a startup, if you're not doing stickers. a startup now, um, we still want you to get involved. So we've made you stickers, and I'm pretty Take sure that no other talk has done this. So. Hustler, it's gone. really exciting. I do, I'm um, going to start Hustler there. You pass that around. We'd like you to take you a sticker. So there are stickers for each three ones. Of Hacker, the different any roles. hackers? Hacker, hustlers, and hipsters. Hackers, slightly few of you. Go on, take a sticker. So the sticker sheets are going to come around, and well, it's going to give hustler. you the kind you'll of You'll probably take three. <laughs> Hacker. Don't just take the one that looks good. So when you're looking to kick off your startup, or as you're you entering into the startup community, the, probably the single most important thing that I found is that it's the people that you know that are going to make the biggest difference to your team. And whether that's as we get later on to like advisors, but meeting people that can be co-founders with you or be part of your founding team means knowing a shed load of people to know who you can work with. So for the next like uh, just uh, 10 minutes, we're going to ask you guys to get up and meet five people around you. So if you're working on an idea or if you have an idea, it's literally like 30 seconds, introduce yourself to each other, work out if you have something in common that you could possibly help each other with, and if relevant, like exchange contact details. Because although the person sat next to you may not be able to help you within the next like two months of what you're doing, it's quite possible that in six months' time, you're going to have a business that might be in a different place that the person sat next to you could know someone that could really, really help you. And if you try and leave, I will point you out so everyone knows you're trying to leave as well. So we're actually going to make you stand up and talk, which I know is pretty brutal, but it's for the greater Come on, good. On, Do your it. Feet, on your feet, people. Come Look on, everyone. Lively. Come on. <laughs> you could be meeting the co-founder of the next billion dollar business here. Come on. Don't sit at the back picking your nose. Look lively. <laughs> no, we're going to call you out. <laughs> oh, look, people leaving. <laughs> What's your name? 
to see you. Is it good? They can't hear me. Either. Hello? Oh, I'm rich. Is there a hustler? Is anybody a hustler? Yeah. A hustler. We've got a hacker here and he's a hustler. I'm just facilitating. There we go. That's what he's doing. Hello. Okay, guys, change up. It's great having good chat, but keep changing, keep moving. Next people. This is your last person you're going to talk to before we're going to get you to sit down again. <laughs> Come on, stop talking to the people you're talking to. Find someone else, someone else. You never know what, the, what life may bring you.
Robin, are we good? Should we do good? Is that 10 minutes or is that? <laughs> cool. Everyone, thank you very much. That, that was good. If you all want to take a seat, um, we will. Uh, obviously, you can chat afterwards, but that was good. You now know each other. Come and sit down, sir. I can see you want to. You're thinking about it. You're <laughs> like, am I going to do it? Am I not? There will probably be time at the end. So if you met someone that yeah, you didn't get the there. details of, like, go. Uh, there are stickers there. If you literally <laughs> just want the Robin. stickers for your laptop or anything <laughs> like that, they, they're there. Um, you. Cool. <laughs> that was exciting, wasn't it? Okay, can I just say, whilst all you were standing up and having fun, look at all the boring people still <laughs> sitting down. They're not having fun. You're having fun. <laughs> this is where it's at, guys. <laughs> Okay. Oh, we're talking about pies here, right? <laughs> this is my bit. Now you've okay. So obviously, once you've got a company and you set it up, a lot of people. One of the main things they ask is, how do I structure the equity in my company? I, I've got 100 percent of a company. How do we split it up between us? Now, sometimes, and a lot of people advise this. Just say you've got two people and you're co-founding a, a team, a company with two people. Sometimes it's right to go 50-50. Now, sometimes that is the case. Sometimes it's not. Um, and I'd say it works well. You look at co-founders like um, Sergey Brin and Larry Page and, and Google, and, and that was obviously, they had a pretty similar skill set. They came into it with the same amount, and um, they, they pretty much matched each other, so that was pretty fair. But sometimes you might find one co-founder has uh, more resource than the other. One might have more skills. One might have more, have more, might have more money to put into it. And so... There are other theories where you should split up a company into, say, four or five different slices, and you reward one slice for so whoever's going to be the f person who goes out fundraising, whoever's going to go out and rate, uh, sort of build the product, whoever's going to go out and sell the product, um, whoever's going to go out and, um, and, and uh, manage the company. And you can actually um, sort of work out. And I think what you've got to do is you've got to pick something that's fair. But what's more important than all of this is making sure that you have vesting in place. Um, and vests. vesting is, is not about making anything to do with vests, but vesting basically gives each co-founder security that you're in it for the long haul. Now, you've probably all heard these, these, common, these, these horror stories where you start a company with somebody and after, say, a year, 18 months, the other, other co-founder goes off and does their own thing. They've had enough of it or they've got a kid, they've got married, they don't want to be sort of living off ramen for the rest of their lives and they've just got fed up. You continue building your company and it, you somehow manage to turn it into, say, a 20, so, uh, so maybe a $15 billion company. You're pretty happy. But then they turn up and say, hey, I want my slice of the pie. You don't want to get into that scenario. So what vesting does, it makes sure that the co-founders are aligned in their, in, their, in their interests. So say, for example, you've got two co-founders, um, each with 50%. And then you raise investment. Often an investor will say, we want to have those shares vested. And that means that the co-founders will have to earn their shares over time. Typically, that's a four or five year period. But one of the things that I've, I, I, to be honest, when I started business, a business, it wasn't something I was that keen on. But looking at all the stories where co-founders fall out, um, it makes total sense to have this in place. You always it's think like that won't be us. We're, we're tight. We're a really good team. But even within like Wire, we see team structures changing all the time. You can't anticipate what's going to happen and you have to get the formal stuff in place. So you're covered. And, and just be honest with yourself. It's kind of thing. It's very rare. I mean, even when you, you, um, you start a relationship uh, with somebody, it's, it's never uh, a guarantee that it's going to work out. And, and what vesting does, it's a pretty much a prenup. Uh, and it just works out, it just give, it determines how things are going to work out if it doesn't go quite well. So this is all great because it's kind of, you've got a founding team and it's all done really well. And we'll come on to a bit on how you could find a founding team and what you should look out for. But some of you may be a single founder, which is the situation that uh, I'm in. So I'm a single founder of uh, my business and there are large analogies to be drawn with being a single mother. These are your six children that you are like constantly looking after all the time. And if you're going to be a single founder, there's a lot of support that you're going to need. You're going to probably need a lot of money and you're going to have to be pretty flexible because running a startup by yourself is undoubtedly like a six times more time consuming and harder than it can be if you have a team to do it together with. However, it can be okay. So quick show of hands is a selection of companies. Does anyone know out of these which were run by a single founder? So put your hand up if you think it was Amazon. Plenty of fish. 
You might not know Balsamic, but it's a really cool templating system that if you're doing a startup, you should use. Anyone know Balsamic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and eBay. Anyone think I had a single founder? So, the real trick in the slide, they all did. <laughs> so, hey. All, hey, you can do it. Uh, all of these companies had a single founder. So, like, obviously, each one has their own story, but it means it is possible to do it. There are just certain things <laughs> that you fuck load harder. need to think about. Which is the next slide, which is that you need to be prepared. If you're going to do this by yourself, there's tons of stuff that you need to be prepared for. There's a reason that uh, investors and VCs look for the three people structure. It's because it works better and it is the best way for a team to be. So if you're going to do it by yourself, you're going to have to show that you can make this work. So that's not saying I can do it all. It's fine. I learned to program and I'm really great at marketing and I can do the sales and I'm a really good accountant as well. You have to show that you've identified where the gaps are, like that you like physically and like in terms of time can't do. And you have to show who's going to be plugging them. So if you're working with an agency or a freelancer, you have to show that you've got that relationship like nailed. You know that exactly how much you're spending, how you can get stuff done. The relationship is smooth. Um, you've got to prove that you can do this with the other people supporting you. Get as much money as you can because uh, by yourself, you're going to have to pay people most likely to do it. Get really good at convincing other people about what you're doing. That kind of thing takes time to do. Like the first time you go out and start pitching, most likely no one's going to believe what you're saying because you're still figuring out a lot of it yourself. But over a period of time, you'll get better and better at pitching. And the better you get, the more you're going to convince other people to come and join you. So if you do do that, if you're trying to find co-founders and work out how to build a team around you, where can you go to get them? So without a doubt, the single best way to find co-founders is people that are just your friends. So people that you have met in part of the scene. Like the tech community is, it's the reason that I'm so glad that I quit my job because it's the single best thing about the startup community. It's the people that you meet, the way it's so easy. Like you can ask to go for a coffee with anyone from here and everyone will probably say yes. It's the most open environment. So start making friends because today you started earlier meeting people and that person could end up being your co-founder or they could know someone that's going to be your co-founder. The bigger your network is, the easier it's going to be to find someone that you could legitimately start a great business with. Um, a great place to start doing it with by yourself and you're just coming into the community is Startup Weekends. They're hackathons and they are a brilliant way to like meet people from all the three disciplines to start building a team and start working on something together. So sign up to the next one and just go along. And even if you don't work with those people, you'll still make great friends that you'll stay in touch with who might know someone else that's kind of good. Work in startups, um, that's a great site uh, that you get lots of people posting on it. I've definitely known people that have met their co-founders through it. It's a bit easier if you're a hacker and you're looking for a hustler. There's a lot of hustlers looking for hackers. Um, but it's definitely worth checking it out and putting a post up to have some conversations. Um, and then founder dating is something that's recently been set up. Um, it's running in cities um, and you can apply through LinkedIn. You need a recommendation from someone uh, to come through. So it's kind of the idea that it's validated founders that you know you're probably hopefully get on vaguely well with. So if you are looking to create a founding team, what kind of things should you be looking for in your co-founders, Rich? Well, Robin, thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, well, to be honest, one of the things you should look for is complementary skill sets. There's no point you both being programmers or you both having sales skills. To be honest, to begin with, when there's just two people, there's just too much to do for you to have a lot of overlap. Um, and that's why the kind of hacker, hustler, hipster philosophy is kind of preached about. And to be honest, I know that a lot of people say that that's kind of what you should do. It's very hard to make it work out like that. And I don't think you should kind of can it in because you can't find that. You just have to make do with what you have. Like Robin kind of set up a business by herself. She's not a programmer. Are you a designer? I'm a PowerPoint designer. <laughs> I'm not a good no. one at that. You can tell these. Um, and, uh, but she is a hustler and she can find the resource that she has. But one of the main things that I have a co-founder with my company, Delishery, and one of the main things that I, I looked for when, when trying to find somebody to start that business with me um, was somebody who could, could help me do the things that I didn't have time to do and do the things better than I could actually do them. So I'm a, I'm a programmer by background. I, spent, uh, I studied computer science at uni, as I, as I mentioned. So one of the things that I'm probably not as strong as other people in is sales and actually the business development of things. And so my co-founder is not a techie guy. He's not really a designer, but he's a very creative person and he's good at sales. Um, and so he's, he kind of handles that side of things, um, which really helps, um, helps me. 
One thing that you've got to look at, though, is you've got to get on. There's no point just having a, a sort of a complementary skill set and then not get on with that person. You've got to be prepared that you've got to, be, you've got to work with this person, probably more than you're going to see your girlfriend, your wife, or your husband or boyfriend. You're going to, you're going to be living with this person pretty much 24-7, although you should be. Um, and so that's the kind of thing. You need to get on, and I, I think it's one of these things. It's, you can't do this in a short space of time. Getting a co-founder is like going out with somebody. You can't just decide you're going to go out with them after the first date unless they're really hot. <laughs> uh, and, um, and that's the other thing. Don't, just, don't choose co-founders based on how attractive they are. It never works out well. <laughs> uh, next slide. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Hiring, firing, and outsourcing. So let's say you've uh, done it. You've like, managed to find your founding team, which is brilliant, and you're growing, which is great news. So how do you start taking people on? Um, and if you haven't, then you're looking to kind of build a team around you by hiring them. Where do you start? But first, we have a nice picture of the Google co-founders on uh, Swiss Bulls. Look how happy they are. <laughs> they're very rich. That's, how, that's because they found each other and they're hugging. <laughs> This could be you. <laughs> if you hire correctly. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, hiring is the same. As, uh, fortunately, <laughs> like, hopefully, your business will be at the point that you've got a good co-founder, it's all working out well, but you've got so much shit on that you need to hire somebody. And there's different ways you can do that. So you could look for somebody. I mean, if you've got one role, and to be honest, to begin with, I don't think this should be the way that you should go. But if you've got w so much stuff on that you need to hire somebody full time, then um, you need to, to, to sorry, if, you, if you've got so much stuff on that you're spending your time and you think there's enough of that stuff that so one person can do, you can get somebody to work for you full time. Now, the problem with that is finding somebody for a full time job, unless they're a generalist, uh, is very hard. Um, and it, it limits you quite a lot. So often co-founders are generalist people. Finding somebody to be a full time person um, is often a specialist role. So the three kind of main ways that, that you can do that is actually sort of work out exactly what task you think you can get somebody else to do that. Uh, and, and then you kind of go on to, to actually going out and finding them, which is where you're going to ask. Yeah. You're going to find out how do we get these people? Well, number one, is, so I've always had to hire people to do uh, Dash. So whether it was originally with freelancers or with agencies and now from my team. Um, and going back to that slide about like the dream versus the desperate reality. Um, this is where I've realized getting help from someone when you're interviewing is one of the most important things. So I needed a technical person to help me build my product. And so the want to do that was so big that I kind of always compare it to customer development. Like I was looking at this person and thinking, you're it. Like, you must be it. You can program. You must be the right person. And I'd like ask leading questions to try and get the answers that I thought I wanted to hear because I just really badly wanted this person to be the right person to work in part of my team. And the minute that I had advisors to come in and start joining me and actually interview with me made the biggest difference. So if you're looking to hire people, first of all, write down way before you meet them what you need from this role and then what you'd like from this role. And Almost if you can, like record the interview because it will give you, if you're by yourself, it will give you that perspective afterwards to listen to what the person said when you ask those questions rather than like nodding and going, yeah, yeah, oh, I'm sure that's fine, you'll learn it, it's okay. Um, so try really hard to be as level headed as you can. And if you can, get someone else to sit in with you. So for me, it was getting someone that had a really like strong technical background to ask the questions that I frankly was just like incapable of asking and was too misguided to think to ask. And so get help. You, you should. The only point you should hire is when you are at your wit's end and you've, you've tried so hard and you've got so much on your plate that you cannot continue anymore. Um, it, there's no point hiring when you don't need the resource. So it's the kind of thing that often your first hire is going to be the most important for your business. And it's so important to get that right. But before that, you need to make sure that you are, you're actually going to, you're taking the right steps. And, and it's one of those things that I reckon, I mean, personally, I would always bring on freelancers or interns before I employed somebody full time. Just another interim slide, just in case. So yeah, inter <laughs> interns. I mean, interns for me are the best way to go when it's starting your business. And I think that the, uh, the sort of job economy, how it is at the moment, it makes it very easy for you to find interns. Um, and there are lots of very bright graduates that are coming out of university that uh, are ideal for the first kind of employees for a business. Um, they make for kind of a temporary resource. They're fairly cheap. And a lot of them have got some very good ideas and they've got some great skill sets, skill sets that are often aren't sort of realized upon. 
And another thing is one of the things that you have when you're, when you're first start, setting up a business is you probably don't really know exactly what the role that that person needs to fulfill, maybe unless it's a technical role. But often when it's kind of biz dev, sales, um, sort of uh, community management, you kind of need somebody just to handle that stuff and take that off your plate. And interns are often really, really good for those kind of things. Depending on sort of, and actually whoever they are, whether they're an intern, whether they're a freelancer, or whether they're a full-time employee, get the contracts right. And I've seen so many people get burnt um, and hurt because, because they haven't got the contracts right. And you need to make sure that you've kind of got the, the clauses in there, like what are their obligations, um, have a probationary period in place. That's for any of those categories because it's one of those things that an interview can go very well, but after three or four weeks of working with that person, you might not think they're the right person to be in that role. And so you need a very easy way to get rid of them. And that's the whole point of a probationary period. And it's for them to try out as well. But we're talking about from a company's point. So you want to you slash them as quickly as possible. <laughs> if necessary. But if you do that, that's why the, the strongest part of any contract is the IP assignment. Anyone that comes, that steps into your office or sits at your desk or looks at your code or works anywhere near your startup has to sign an IP assignment to make sure anything that they work on technically belongs to your company. So if you are looking to hire people, everyone has uh, the horror stories of hiring. It is, it's a nightmare. It's really, really difficult to find great people um, that you want to join your team. Recruiters are going to try and charge you like 20% of a person's salary and no startup can afford that kind of fee. So you need to be creative and think of new places to find them. So again, one of the best places to start is your friends. Like uh, every single good hire that I've made in Dutch has come through contacts and friends. And whether that's other startups that happen to know someone or just over time, a relationship that I've built with someone. So get to know people and try and hire through them if you can. Um, LinkedIn, there's, a, there's tons of like job postings and boards. Um, I'd say Three Beards is also a great site. Uh, LinkedIn is pretty successful with people that we know. To be totally honest, we've tried Stack Overflow with varying success. So uh, I would say for your company, like work out what you're looking for, try the post. But for me, I only had uh, one punt at doing it. And uh, my punt was to use Silicon Milk Roundabout. It's a brilliant careers fair um, that is run just for the startup community. Um, they have a day for product and design and they have a day for developers. It costs like, uh, I think it was like 250 quid for a stand. Um, and you probably meet throughout the day like 250 people. Um, it's a brilliant way to just meet tons of new faces. Um, and then there's uh, Hire My Friend and Rollpoint, which are relatively new sites that have just been set up, which is to try and help you find people through social recommendations. So you know there's at least some like, validation of the person that you're talking to. So once you've uh, found this brilliant person that may not turn out to be so brilliant. You need to get rid of them. Oh, oh my, my God, God it makes me move. When we were practicing this, it didn't move. It's moving. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's amazing. <We> <laughs> I hope nobody's epileptic in this. <laughs> if you are, <laughs> kindly move that way without looking at the screen. Um, I just want to make it very clear that um, Lord Sugar does not shoot people. Um, this, is, this is a joke. There's but no legal implications that he does shoot people. <laughs> just want to be very clear on that. Okay, this is too much. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move it back in a minute. Anyway, so once you've found that dream person, you need to get rid of them. Um, can we put it back for this one bit? Okay. One of the, one of the, there's a famous like, sort of saying in business, and it's hire fast, fire faster. And, and it's one of those things that like, when, I, when I first hired people, we had a t I, I remember we had a team of six, but there was one person on the team that really wasn't fitting in properly. I mean, they, they didn't really sort of participate in the team activities. They were slacking behind a bit. They weren't a pleasure to be around in the office. And they were okay for the first few weeks, but it was one of those things that they were actually just doing their job properly, but they just didn't fit into the company. And that's probably the hardest decision you're going to have to make is where you've got an employee that's actually generally pretty good at what they do, but they just don't fit with you and they, they don't just fit with the company and where you actually want to be. And that's always a tough place to be because you don't want to get rid of them because they're doing their job properly, but at the same time, they're not going to be in it for the long haul. Um, and so when I'd say is when you get to that point, start acting upon it like start looking at what you're going to do start looking for other people um and when it comes to the point you're actually going to have to fire them uh sort of go into an office get some time with them explain to them exactly fully why they're doing it sort of why why you're going so sort of why you're taking these actions and to be honest from the the five or six people that i've had to let go from different businesses i found if you've a pretty if you're pretty honest about the motivations for it and you're pretty open about it and if they are genuinely a pretty good person it's just a, a fit thing 
and you can help them find a new role, you can move back if you want, if that's <laughs> hurting people's eyes. Um, then then, uh, then they, they respond pretty well to it. And I found, for two, two employees of, of my last business, we found them new roles, in, uh, ones they were probably slightly better suited to. And you kind of learn from it. And there's no point kind of um, sort of having people there that are just going to sit on the bench, that, that aren't ever going to be actually the, the quarterbacks, that aren't actually going to be playing. You need to find, you're slowly going to go through that stage. And as your startup gets better, you're going to find that the people that were there with you at the very beginning aren't good enough. And you need to replace them. And it's a tough thing to do, but that will be the sign of any good business person is how they can actually get rid of the shit people. Well, they were good at the time, but they're not so good anymore. And actually start replacing them with the, the people that you need. And the people who are going to do the specialist roles. Because when you're a very small company, you need generalists. As you become bigger and bigger and bigger, you need people who are specialists in their fields and you're going to need more of them. Because the only thing worse than not having someone to do a job that you need is actually spending money on someone that can't do the job that you need them to do. So as soon as you identify that it's not working, it's time to buy them. So what, I mean, one of the things that you can do in the, in the meantime is find freelancers. Uh, and apparently there's a computer game called Freelancer, which is really cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and it, but it, what it comes down to is how do you manage them? And I know a lot of people that will go, oh, no, but freelancers are really expensive or whatever. They're expensive if you don't manage them properly. Often you have, when you're, when you're, when you're getting going business, you have a specific task. Like it might be, I need somebody to write the copy on my website. I, I, I need somebody to, to build the marketing page on the website. These aren't full-time jobs to begin with. Like this is not something that you're going to need somebody for a full-time role. Um, and so that's a very sort of specialist vertical that quite often you're going to find better people by going to places like Elance, Odesk or Concept Cupboard um, and actually being able to recruit them through there. Now, there are, best, there, there are good practices that you need to sort of take on board to be able to do that. So when you're working with freelancers, always have in mind exactly kind of what you're looking to do and work with them. Um, so if it's, for example, building a landing page, spec out the landing page as much as you can do using tools like Balsamic, which is pretty easy to use. We showed it up there. It's like a wireframing tool. Get as much information down as you possibly can because they, their, their job is to manage your expectations. And so if you can provide them with as much information as possible, then it's less of a risk. Um, has anyone used Elan's Odesk or Concept Cover before? Yeah, so a few of you have. Uh, good experiences? Yes, no? We haven't got a microphone. There we go. Why don't, we, why don't this be interesting? Peter's an interesting guy. <laughs> He's talking. Are you talking later on or have you already talked? Uh, I've talked Ten. earlier on today. Okay, well, maybe we could just. Uh, you were here. Uh, who, th who saw Peter's talk this morning? Was it good? Oh, yeah. that's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, good. I've got to say, I can't vouch for finding somebody on Odesk. It is a very, very good system for, um, for actually employing somebody, especially the guy that we found turned out to be excellent, and we ended up moving him off Odesk because it, takes, it costs a premium. But they take screenshots of the person's screen the whole time that they're working. They cover all of the foreign transfer stuff because you're usually going to be hiring abroad, and that's a hassle. Um, so, so I've certainly found Odesk to be very good. Yeah, so I think it, it, it's, it's one of those things that often you need to find the right kind of person and, and that's what Odesk and Elance are just a big pull. Concept Cupboard is pretty much the same, but it's for students. Um, so often you can sort of get slightly less experienced people, but they're often a little bit cheaper as well. Um, so to be honest, like once you, you get slightly better at sort of managing people on, on these platforms, that's where you really start getting into it. And to be honest, like for the stuff that we do nowadays, probably about 50, 60% of our resources is managed through freelancers. Um, and, uh, and to be honest, that's, that's the way I kind of like to do things. That's the way I like that's it. That's the way. That's <laughs> the way I like it. Um, I can give you a bad story of how to screw things up when using uh, freelancers. So uh, I did a straight dating app before I started doing Dutch, um, and I decided to use Elance to do it, and I knew nothing about product whatsoever. So I decided to spec out my app on a PowerPoint, which started off with a list of features and then had a couple of wireframes. I knew nothing really about what I was asking this person to do. I hadn't taken the time to actually even understand like uh, programming structures and how everything would fit together, what the front end versus the back end would be. He was making these decisions about what database I should be using, and I didn't take the time to go and check if that was the right decision for me or not. 
Another little tip, if you're gonna use uh, a freelancer that says they will have no verbal communication with you, that's not good when you don't know what you're doing because you kind of need a bit more advice than that. So when he said he wouldn't have a Skype call, I probably should have paid a bit more attention. Um, and when it gets to the stage when you're having emails, when they're saying that they need to feed their children and you're saying you need your fucking app, it's probably not going too well and you should work out when the point is to leave. So know what you're doing, as Rich said, like when you go into this, learn as much as you can. If you're going to this resource, like be aware what you're asking for someone. And again, get advice from someone that does know this. If you don't get someone to plug the gaps in your team to at least advise you so they can do code checks with you and actually see what's being built and help you make those decisions. Um, uh, another thing I messed up was using an agency. So. Uh, um, agencies are a kind of solution, as seeing as uh, Rich uh, runs one, I will treat this with caution. <laughs> um, but uh, generally in experience, uh, agencies are a solution. And uh, going back to the dream desperation scenario, you're often going to be using an agency because you don't have many other choices. You probably tried to find a founding team. You probably maybe spoken to some freelancers and the cost isn't right. And so you've spoken to some agencies who says that they're looking to do an equity share with you. And they'll take 15% of your company and maybe a small amount of money to help you build something. If you use an agency, the fact is you're going to get something done. And that's a good thing. If you're trying to build an idea and you've got something, it's great to start moving forwards with it. Um, but I would just say be prepared and kind of understand what you're about to lose. So agencies are pretty expensive. So if you've got tons of cash, it's probably actually okay because you can keep paying them as time goes on. If you don't have that much cash, think about how much equity you're giving away. I don't know a single like startup team that has worked with an agency that has been uh, happy with it after six months, except from all of Flox's customers. Um, uh, after that time, like your, your product needs change. Like What you're looking for in your startup is always going to change. And if you're signed up to build a certain thing for a certain amount of equity, you're going to be like, oh, actually, do you know what? We do need to change this because we realized in the space of uh, what you said was three months, but is now actually six months, we've learned something else about our business. And they're not going to change it for you. They're going to say it's scope creep. And they'll either ask for more equity or they'll ask for more money. It's really difficult to make this work. And if you know what you're doing or you have a ton of money, it's pretty good. Or if you are really desperate and you want to get stuff done, then uh, it's also another kind of solution. I guess the agency model isn't really set up for startups. If you think about startups, you're going to want to change a lot. And pretty much mo well, most agencies and a lot of the work that we've done for people is being spec. You need yeah. to spec it up. Uh, and the problem is that you, you don't quite have that, that struck, the, sort of the, the, the platform that you can actually iterate on stuff quick enough. So uh, to give you some example, we work with a lot of big newspapers um, to build their apps for them. And straight away, we sort of have a spec, we have a budget, and we get that all signed off. Like if you would spend a lot of your time doing that as a, as a, as a, a co-founder, like you're, not, you're not breaking that down into individual steps enough. Um, having said that, there are approaches like, if you, if you, has anyone heard of like ad agile methodology, sort of where you can iterate on things quicker? Some, some agencies are doing that, but the problem that you have is the fact that they have a, a fixed cost. They're playing, say, a developer 200 pounds a day. They're gonna have to work out a way that they can charge you four or 500 pounds a day for it. Um, so you've always got to remember that. And I always think that, at the end of the day, the added advantage of the agency is you can't, it's almost like a safety net, but you are more than likely going to feel like you got a little bit ripped off. But you will get there, um, get especially if you use Fox. So yeah. <laughs> discount rates. So yeah. You get a 20% discount after this talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your culture. So culture can kind of be broken down and we're going to break it down into two different parts for you. One is kind of like operational culture and how to actually make the day-to-day -day culture within your company work. And then the other is the kind of softer side of culture and how... Uh, bye, guys. Guys, guys, what's happened here? <laughs> we no could follow them. Here. We could just do, do the talk. <laughs> so, yeah, well, culture is... Um, <laughs> where, where are you going? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Right. <laughs> this is what's going to happen to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. Right. Um, yeah. So anyway, what are we talking That's about? Culture. Yeah. yeah right. I mean, culture is a pretty big part of a, a company because if you think about it, like, what do you do in life? Like, you sleep, <laughs> you eat, you work. Uh, I mean, that's all I do now. <laughs> that's all I <laughs> do. So, I mean, wrong. work is like is pretty important. So, I guess the only thing that kind of makes that manageable is kind of the culture of, of the company, and how you kind of manage that. And I very much see sort of um, so I want to build the companies that that I have into sort of sort of t like 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 I, like I when I was at, when I was at university in school we had teams and sports teams and I really like the culture and the sort of the the the, the camaraderie that you had with those teams um, and and sort of how we worked um, but you've got to remember you are at work and so you've got to work out how 
Um, what are the structures that you can get place as an organization to, to make work as good as possible? And one of the things as a startup is that you don't quite have that structure at the very beginning as you do in a lot of big corporations where you come in, you have your induction day. Often you can't spend a lot of money training somebody up. Um, so, for example, Sahil came in yesterday. It was his first day yesterday. Um, how long was your induction? Probably about an hour. That was it. <laughs> Trying to show. Here's the, here's the coffee machine. Here's the toilets. Here's a load of paperwork. <laughs> uh, no, but it's one of those things that you kind of need to, to work out what's going to be right for you. So there are plenty of tools, and this is uh, Trello is one. I don't know if is anyone. Does, many people use Trello. Hi. So Trello, if you don't already use it, just go and check it out. It's a really sort of... It's free. It's free, which yeah. is always good. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a tool that you can use to kind of project manage stuff. And, and it gives you a little bit of structure around what is quite an unstructured environment. Um, and, uh, but, it, but it is important to get that right. And it, it's one of those things. You've always got to remember, this is people's work. And they want to, what people want, they want to see that they have, uh, they have progression in their, in their careers. They want to see that they actually um, are respected for what they do. And so you kind of need to have that structure that makes them feel that they have, they're on the right track to sort of moving forward with things. Yeah. I'd say startups are quite like an unpredictable environment. Like things are changing so often week to week that if you can put some regularity within it, so if it's always having a weekly team catch up on a Monday and then always like using Trello, you have to have some consistency. So as much as stuff might change, try to keep the consistency there so you actually get some sense of progress that's happening within your business. So, so what we do, uh, both Delishery and we also do at Flox, is we have week-long sprints. So on Monday mornings, we'll have um, a, a, a morning meeting where we'll go through everything we want to achieve in a week. Uh, and then every single day at 9, it used to be 9.15, it's now 9.45. Oh, uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> this is the, 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 the upside of having a startup is you can get up later. <laughs> they also work later. Um, at 9.45, we have a daily stand-up. That means everybody kind of stands around. That's why we had a photo of a scrum, by the way. It's because we call it a scrum. And you kind of uh, so you, you kind of discuss what you're working on this week, uh, what you're working on today, and if you have any blockers, like are you having any, any trouble with what you're doing? And, and you basically, it's an open forum to see if you can uh, solve any of those problems. Scrums tend to work well when you've kind of got up to 10 people. Any more than that, you don't really get the content. So when you're big enough that you can start splitting out into different areas, um, you kind of want to do that. Um, but it's really important to get that communication. And we finished the week with a demo day on Friday, so everybody at the end of the week can kind of demo what they've done and what they've worked on. Uh, and it's, it's a good platform for people to actually show, because quite often when you've got your head down and you're working on a project for six months, it's a bit annoying that you don't really get to show it off. Um, and so every week on a Friday, it's quite nice to actually sort of show progress on what you're doing. Yeah. So then uh, on to the kind of uh, softer side of culture. There's, uh, working in a startup is a completely unique experience and uh, most of you, if you've worked in a job before, you're leaving this and you're going into something completely unknown. And so developing the softer side of your culture is uh, equally important because uh, if you're screwing it up, then the person's just as likely to go back to working there or at least they had a decent salary and some kind of pension. And uh, taking care of the small things actually has a monumental like uh, impact on building your company as an amazing place to work. And I think really it's about the small things that you do and that's what makes it completely different in a startup. So it could be, well, I mean, it's kind of a boring culture thing, but I need to do fun things. But like their stand-up meetings is something that's important to them. They know that they do it and it gives them structure to what they do. We have like a weekly bake-off. It's a largely female team and it's a cliche, but uh, we have a weekly bake-off and someone brings in cake like once a week. But it's the kind of stuff that becomes important about our company. Like that's what people like about it. We always have sweets on our desk and people come and visit our company because they know they're going to yeah. get that. Yeah, <laughs> Jelly beans are really high up, lesbians. Um, but you have to think about these things because some things will just happen naturally um, and some things you have to actually take the time to consider to make sure that they do happen. So we are going to ask you to think about it. So if you are setting up a company now or you're, if you're thinking about setting one up or if you have a hypothetical company that you might set up, what kind of culture and what kind of company would you want to build? And it's best to like think about it through kind of like emotional points almost through like uh, an employee or someone coming into the company. So, Or even actually good examples of if, if anybody's worked at other companies that have been doing this yeah. well. Best, um, like, best examples that you've seen it. And if, what we're going to ask you to do is write down these three things and we're going to randomly pick on you. So do please write them down or think of something for each one. And the best one gets a t-shirt. Gets a job at Dutch. 
Then there's a, you can have any men which are mainly as they can get a Dutch account. And the overall um, winner gets a place at Wira, is that yeah. right? <laughs> so any? A place. A pl so if you want a place at Wira, it's 40,000 euros funding, uh, <laughs> I think, is it? Or they sort of jiggled it about. Uh, is this what we're doing, this prize? And yeah. the T-shirt. And the T-shirt. And the T-shirt. So can you write down it's one it's example? It's mainly a T-shirt, people. <laughs> Of either the kind of company you would like to work in or the kind of company you would like to set up, what would be an amazing thing that you could do that would be like a weekly builder thing? So if it is like a weekly bake-off or if it is a weekly trip to the pub on a Friday, but maybe more creative than that. Um, if it's someone's leaving do, what do you do to say goodbye to that person? Like, do you just go to the pub or do you get them like a get certain Get them wasted. Kind of good? <laughs> Thanks, see ya. Um, we had the 10 Jager Bomb Challenge. What actually, are you going to give them? Were. So we're going to give you like three minutes, one for each one. And uh, then we're going to randomly pick on three of you and the best one gets a t-shirt. Go. <laughs> a lot of you not writing, that's bad. Are you, why are you not writing, what's wrong? Can, can you write? Go oh, right then, come on, come on, this is important. <laughs> the culture piece within your company defines the company you build. It actually defines the product you make. I know it sounds boring, it sounds tedious, it's actually not. It's one of the most important and fundamental things you can do in your company. So do scribble down, scribble down hard. Think interesting, exciting, beautiful thoughts. What would you do if you could do anything to help your employees? No, no. I have a talking company, it's a good company where we talk. <laughs> does, it, does anyone have a, an urge to tell us about an experience they had at maybe at one of their old companies that was really cool or really bad, or really bad for culture? <laughs> Things you should no. not do to make it a nice culture. No. Ah, oh, no. gentlemen yes. over here. Yes. Great interaction from man with a beard. Uh, working at a consultancy in the city, big, big company, um, you don't get a fixed desk. You have to book in every day to a desk. You're never with anyone who you know, just random people. Bad thing? Obviously, it's yes. terrible. <laughs> Just checking. Also, you have to keep your desk tidy because I guess it's not your desk. Yeah. Yeah. Which we are both monumentally bad at doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, what? Okay, how are you doing? Do you guys uh, have them down? Yes. Feedback loop says yes. Yep. Cool. Okay. So, you pick first person. Uh, first person. Mm, you. You, yes. No, he's got oh. the wrong one. <laughs> That's fine. It's okay, you have a battle, a battle. He's got the first. So for the first one, for a weekly builder, what would you do? Uh, well, I would uh, once a week uh, make a trip or something uh, useful. So for example, it would be uh, going to, I don't know, uh, make a campfire outside and guitar, music, beers, something like that. Or maybe even be useful, like uh, go to the elder's home and... Like nice, that. actually yeah. practical stuff. You get a bit wrapped up uh, inside startups, building things that don't actually turn into something sometimes. So that would be very good. <laughs> this gentleman, uh, he's grinning. He's got something oh, funny to say. Oh, he's got a good one. <laughs> um, all right. Hello. Yeah. Because, uh, because I'm starting a startup around um, classes and local lessons, um, I think a good thing that we would do is go to a, a local class once very a nice. month. So we'll pick out a class, right. a random class in a hat, and then once a month we'll go to a class as a team. I think that would be something good. Yeah. I think that's an amazing idea. Good. You pick a few. Uh, so, ooh, guy's wearing the same shirt. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> the one in the front. It's slightly different. <laughs> and then we'll have one behind as well. A leaving party. Uh, someone leaving on their own accord is quite annoying. So I think emulate the person the whole day, the whole office. Ooh, dress nice. the same as them. Yeah. Same mask. <laughs> but you guys emulator. prepared for? Like this, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
didn't like that. Maybe that. <laughs> nice. And then the chat behind you. I don't know. Uh, on Friday, sorry, on Friday we can go out to have a drink together at the end of uh, the week. Would you all have to drink something specific, like shots, or do you think you could be flexible with I it? I think beer goes beer. away. Beer, better, better. A loosener, yeah. a loosener yeah. before better. the weekend. Yeah. But you can see, I mean, <laughs> I'd say startups are a pretty unique atmosphere, but there oh, are no, some... Wait, wait, best idea, best idea. What are we doing? Oh, yeah, what was the best idea? T-shirt, T-shirt. Who's uh, going to vote for this? I think the school was the best idea. Yeah, that was, that was quite yeah, nice. Yeah, that's a great idea. Really you got a place in Moira. Yeah, 40,000 euros. That's not official. <laughs> you haven't got a place in Moira. That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, so, in all seriousness, though, but... Um, yeah, startups are a pretty unique atmosphere where you look at some companies and it, you don't need to be like Google where you give out, you have a free canteen of food and sweets and lots of things like that. But you could be Apple. You could be Apple <laughs> like that. Um, but you could look at companies like, there's a company called Buffer. Um, every year they take all of their employees away to some remote island and uh, just work with them with a, on a week. Um, actually, they also offer, a re like they all work remotely. So they basically kind of get up when they want, work when they want. Um, obviously, you have to manage that pretty well, um, but it seems to work for them. There are amazing packs. Like in our team, we don't have like a fixed start time for everyone. We know what hours everyone wants to work, but we kind of let everyone pick the hours that they wanted to start that works best for them. So everyone knows what time we're meant to be like online and when we're doing stuff. So it's completely flexible and it's the perks. That's the, the great stuff about running a startup and then use Trello to manage it. Yeah. So, I mean, when you join a big company, it's often quite a daunting experience. So you've got to, I always think, put myself in, in my employee shoes and think about uh, so how they're feeling. What is, their, what is their first day going to be like? Is it going to be... Um, uh, is it going to be quite like, is it like joining Apple? Is it going to be like joining <laughs> Apple? So in Apple, they give on their first day they give out this kind of card that kind of explains that it says there's work and there's your life's work. The kind of work that has your fingerprints all over it. The kind of work that you'd never compromise on. That you'd sacrifice a weekend for. You can do that kind of work at Apple. People don't come here to play it safe. They come here to swim in the deep end. They want what? Oh. <laughs> so somebody's My kicking God, on then. Steve, <laughs> Steve's <laughs> carrying on. Jesus. Um, so I mean, it's quite good. Also, you can prepare your employees for working weekends, as they clearly have done. Um, so, but yeah. it's the kind of thing. I mean, it's building a culture. You can you can get a. Uh, it, you're always going to find your team will work much harder if they actually genuinely believe in what they're doing and they actually feel like they're part of a team and they don't want to let anybody down. So it kind of stuff like starts from day one. It's about building a brand for yourself and and I mean, boy, does it help sort of hiring when you've got a good sort of culture and a good brand around that? Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So on to our favorite section of uh, building a team: interns. Interns are awesome because uh, when you are getting going with your startup, you do need help from as many places as possible. And there's kind of like a, the official side of what we should be saying as part of this presentation. And then the kind of like reality of what you're really looking for. Uh, so should I, I say the official side? You do the official side. Yeah. <laughs> Interns must always be paid minimum wage or more, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no, but genuinely, like, um, I think there's, uh, interns are a great resource and... Um, you can go and speak to people like internships who've got a big stand outside uh, and really leverage off the fact there are lots of smart guys who are still at university or have just finished school or have finished university even that are looking for their first step up in life. Often these guys haven't been able to get jobs. I mean, the job market is pretty tough at the moment, so I'm not going to hold that against anybody. And you can genuinely find some really, really good people. So, um, I mean, what you should do is, yeah. is pay the minimum wage but often you can get away with a lot less than that. <laughs> so uh, this is not the official side of the story. Um, uh, but uh, if you're running something that you kind of uh, really strongly believe in, like uh, I probably work on quite a unique startup and tend to meet quite a lot of people doing what I'm doing, you will often find that you'll meet someone that's willing to work with you for little to no money. Um, and it, there are certain rules about doing that that you have to be very clear on. One is that you cannot set any requirements of what they have to do as part of that job. Uh, so you can't say what hours they have to do. You can't say yeah when they come in, like when they leave, what they do day to day. It's kind of they're effectively volunteering at your company, um, and for that you can cover their costs, so their travel costs. So. I've hired interns from a range of 50 quid a week to uh, like a 200 quid a week, uh, which is getting close to minimum wage. Um, 
realize when you value an intern because if they're doing great work, like don't take the piss, like there's a point, everyone has like a maximum point that they can reach. Um, but if you can get them working with you, it can make a hugely significant difference to your business to kind of get you going. But also interns are kind of up for a lot of stuff, um, except for sex. Don't try and get them to do that. That's, uh, that's, he learned, that's not, no. never a good idea expensive. trying to do that. Don't worry, Sahil, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> but but, <laughs> no, but, but the, the other thing is like you use them for what they actually have. So don't just think an intern can sort of make you cups of tea and coffee. Like there are, and, and quite often when we get an intern in, we'll give them a kind of an hour long interview, working out, give them a, 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 a rough sort of culture fit really and I guess that's the main thing we're looking for people that will fit in and work well with the team I'd take anybody that fits in with the team over their skill set any day I'd rather have somebody that I can actually see um, see them sort of lasting with the company and actually even possibly progressing into a full-time role and that's that's I guess one of the things that is attractive to interns is the fact that a lot of these guys are going to be really driven and use their internship as a as a almost a prolonged job interview and so they're going, to be, they're going to be hugely driven and hungry to basically prove that they're up for this job. And it also gives you a chance to find out what, is, what are their skill sets? Like, what, what are they going to be good at? And the areas they're going to be developing. So it's the kind of thing that I feel that you, you get out of an intern as much as you put in. So you've got to spend time with that person working out what, what works for them, how they can actually help you. Uh, and to be honest, out of probably 12 or so interns I've hired, I've only hated one. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty good. Welcome to the company. Yeah, uh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> but I guess the, like, uh, the moral kind of coming to the story is, uh, yes, cheesy side from little acorns, great oak trees grow. But um, uh, if you're hiring someone, giving them the opportunity to work out what they're great at and add that to your company is probably one of the greatest strengths an intern can, can bring. So we've just hired an intern now. Um, he's come in. We've got a specific campaign that we're running to talk about the gay scene at universities, and he's going to work on a marketing project for us and getting that in the right channels. However, we've set that out as a really clear project, but with the idea that it is an extended interview, that he has to find what he wants to, to add to the team. As he learns more about the business and what we do, he can work out what he thinks he can add to it. So he's a psychology student, and we do a huge amount of customer development as part of building the app. So some like great role that he already has been suggesting that he wants to add to it is to run the customer development sessions and look for the emotional triggers as we're interviewing people to see how the product works well for them. So having a specific project allows you to focus on in with interns when they first come in. So you give them something like really clear to work on, but then giving them the opportunity to speak up and, and give you ideas and let them, let them identify what they care about. Because if they care about it, they're going to work a hell of a lot harder, which sounds bad, but they'll feel a lot more passionately about what they're working on for you. My first ever, like uh, the first ever person that joined me on Dutch was an intern. She just got in touch and was like, I think what you're doing is cool. Can I join? I was like, yes, finally. Um, so she came in and started doing some social media stuff. And straight away, she just like ran with creating amazing content for us, building our blog. And she's now the first full employee that I've taken on. She was our first PAYE. Um, and she's now a community manager. So giving people the breadth to kind of uh, expand their skills really like pays off in the long run. But it also, it's quite, it's quite, I, did, you do, did you ever do an internship? I, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Where did you intern? Um, at an advertising agency. Was it good? <laughs> no. I made a lot of tea. Did you? <laughs> That's probably right, so yeah. I, v I interned at a VC firm when I was at my first year at uni, and I'm now speaking to the same VC firm about investing in one of my companies. So yeah. you can always like, it, I guess that's from the intern's point of view, but you can yeah. always, they're, they're going to be one, they're going to be keen to sort of show what they're made of uh, and actually sort of get to know. So there are, there are doors and I guess part of it is the network as well. Yeah. Like you, often when you're a startup, you're trying to build your network, an intern will come in, they'll be looking to sort of leverage off that as well. So that's one other thing to think about. Yeah. But, but always remember. Yeah, always remember. <laughs> you want to be able to sack them quickly if they're shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, or if they steal things. Um, yeah, if an intern, if things start to go missing, staplers, rulers, Happens other office stationary chairs, <laughs> desks. Fire them. What? Fire them. Fire them. Fire them. Get rid of them. Even if they can't prove it, get rid of them. It's but make them. sure you have your IP assigned. So yes. in <laughs> 
<laughs> You'll probably have a bit of food issue with interns. They're probably going to get an offer of a real job that's probably going to come up if you can't afford to pay them properly yet. So make sure that every single thing that they've done while being at your company belongs to the company. And it's a boring thing and it's really easy to get excited about a new person coming, but get them to sign that IP contract the minute they walk in the door. But also for, I mean, you might think employment contracts, ah, oh, lawyers, really expensive. Ah, oh, I don't want to pay them. So you can actually go online and just find uh, lots of legal companies actually giving out like template documents. Uh, Taylor Wessing do this. Does anyone know any other legal firms that are do doing this? Uh, yeah, I should probably do them. If you email me or tweet at me afterwards, I will send you a link or even just send you a link to some of the ones we use. So yeah. welcome, you're only uh, an hour and 10 minutes late. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, coming into the home stretch, um, uh, advisors. So advisors can be one of the most superb parts to, to building your team. And uh, it's sometimes uh, forgotten, ignored. It's sometimes one of the hardest things to sort out, but it's probably one of the things that you should pay the most attention to because you're talking about getting expert advice coming into your business. Yeah, I, th I think uh, advisors are really important. And it, when we started at Wira, there was this whole kind of day where we dedicated to sort of bringing on mentors and really looking at areas in our business. So this is basically somebody that can uh, be, be your wingman, I guess. It's somebody that you can meet up with some kind of once a month, or even a few people you can meet up with once a month that really help fill in, hit, fill in the gaps. Way! <laughs> uh, fill in the gaps of your business. And um, so, for example, with Delishery, we have four advisors. We've got one who helps with our business development and sales. We've got one who actually owns a chain of restaurants. Uh, we've got one who's a really good user experience uh, expert. And we've got one who is a recruiter and is, just has a very strong network. And what you'll find is a lot of these people, when they're, like, they get, they, they're fairly successful, they want to give something back. Um, and they want to give, they want to look at companies they can possibly get involved in. They might be able to sort of pick you up early and maybe invest in you later down the line. But it's really somewhere they can actually maybe spend just an hour a month and it's something that they can use the skills that they've got in a way that's, it's almost like charitable, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's always one of the, when you first start up, you always kind of think, seriously, are these people ever going to like pay me any time or attention? Are they ever going to be able to like uh, spend that amount of time with me? And to be honest, you don't know until you try. So you need to find the people that you think will make a significant difference to your business and then just try everything you can to get to know who they are. Don't assume like when I first started Dutch, I was like, oh, I should get all the heads of all the big dating businesses and see if I can get in touch with them. And that's not the right thing to do. I'm trying to do something that's really different to other dating businesses. So as Rich was saying, like they identified the different parts of their business that would mean like growth for them and things they didn't know about. And they're going to be the strongest advisors that you can get. And meet them for a coffee. Like uh, just tell them what you're doing. Ask their advice and input. If you can, wait like four to six weeks. Go for another coffee, start buying them a coffee, start buying them a lunch, and then put in the question and say, I would love to have you as an advisor. If I were to buy you lunch, or if you'd be interested, could we carry on doing this every kind of four to six weeks? So yeah, I think, think a lot of people think, when, when actually, when, when we, we said, do, do you want to be an advisor? So a lot of people said, well, what does that, what does that actually mean? Like, yeah. how does it actually work? And I think what we, the way I structure it, at least, is we, I make sure we have one day every month. So maybe that's the first Thursday for breakfast. We meet Neil Dodd, who's the head of user experience at Wonga. And we either meet him at our office or we go over to him and we have breakfast with him. And we go through kind of our, our user journey and we work out. He basically sort of judges it and he spends that time with us. Um, another one of our advisors, we basically email him a week before with our kind of our problem and then we go along and we've pretty much got a one-to-one -one workshop where we've got one of the top guys at Telefonica in advertising putting his time, which, would, which I don't really want to know how much that's worth, uh, into our company for absolutely nothing. And he's doing that because he loves to see startups develop. He's actually invested in two of his previous startups that he's helped guide along. And I guess for him, it's kind of a, a, a way into the community as well. You'll be surprised at what people will give you. Like it can be down to time, it can be actual resources. Like introductions. Uh, yeah, in introductions is one of the most invaluable. Um, but so exercise number three. So we oh, want you to think one. about. This is quite a fun one. I like this, this is one. A good one. Yeah. We want you to. <laughs> this is a good one. <laughs> I'm going to sit down here and let you do this one. <laughs> we want you guys to think about who would be the advisors that would make a significant difference to your business. So. If you're not working on startup, then maybe like turn around to someone that's sitting near you that you know is so you can work out some ideas together. But try and think about the top five people, like where the weaknesses are in your team and in your business and who would be the individuals that would make a really serious difference. And then we're going to play a game. Uh, 
two degrees of separation might be quite lucky. We might need more like 10. Uh, but uh, what we're going to do is uh, pick on some people and get you to suggest one of those people that will make a difference. And you'll be surprised to see if there might actually be anyone in this audience that might know a way that you might be able to get hold of that person. Yeah, so if you can stand up and say, I want to meet Richard Branson, then we'll see if anybody else has an intro to him. Rich or knows him. So Richard Branson, <laughs> probably not so easy. But <laughs> Think of uh, like all the different businesses, whether it's like uh, like product or acquisition or marketing or business or an accountant. Yeah. Like, uh, I want to find a really good accountant. <laughs> I've got yeah, and you stand up, and I'm sure we can pair some people up. So have a little think, a couple That's of good. minutes. What do you need? And then we'll see if we can do some uh, some matching up. This is added value, people. We're giving this away for free, just You're today only. Getting something today only. Tomorrow it's going to be ten pounds. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see how effective that is. No, 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 not yet. We're not back on. No. Cool. All right, so we're going to try doing this. If we get a successful help, then there we're are two more T-shirts up for grabs. And one more place and two more places in Warren. Two more places in Warren. <laughs> right. Good. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to oh, the lady. Why don't we open out? Why open out? Open out. Let's see who's got, who, who, who urgently okay. needs help in one area. Who's got somebody they need to find? Then, go on. Yes. Well, who do go. you want to find? You were first. Go. Who, who are you looking to meet? Phelan Mackle. About two. There we go. Oh. <laughs> I am hey. ringing. Who am I ringing for? <laughs> there we Time go. To so come over right, here. Go, she's, no, he's coming to speak to her. <laughs> yeah. You can speak to Annie afterwards. Oh, he's here. Bring him to the stage. Oh, bring, bring him, him to the, the stage. stage. This is how good Save it is, him. right? Magic, <laughs> magic is in, in, in action here. We Elon can see Musk the magic is here. Is in the room, yeah, exactly. He's going to be magic. <laughs> is, he, is Elon Musk here? No, he's not here. Sorry, Elon Musk is not here. <laughs> right, anybody else? Who wants to meet some cool people? Okay. Anyone Surely else? This, this is the magic we can yes, make happen. They're coming now. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need some, mar is that I need some marketing help. You need some, some marketing help. 
Seth Godin. Does anyone Seth know? Seth Godin. Does anyone know <laughs> Seth Godin? Anyone? Friends what, on what, Twitter? what type of marketing help do you need? <laughs> full stack. Full stack. Whoa, I need a full stack marketer. So, one thing with picking advisors is it's often good to uh, narrow down to specialities. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to think of, like, if it is marketing, then uh, you want kind of, like, brand development. Like, uh, that's where you can find someone that either is, like, uh, the, like, creative director at a branding agency is going to be easier to get hold of than a CMO at yeah. a big, like, uh, corp. So, uh, it's great to go for everything but it's also more accessible to often break it down so if you went for someone that was like a great at branding someone that's great at like a growth acquisition um someone that's great at events um we'll give you like a two minutes and we'll come back to you and see if you can think of anyone in one of those so faces a update on Phelim. he's in an ipr session at the moment so he can't come but be here in 55 minutes what's that in english what is ipr um, and a performance review. Oh, right. Oh. So it's corporate <laughs> bullshit. That's, no, no, no. Uh, it's somebody else's review that he's doing for I one of his staff. Uh, like, oh, let's do that's it still at the corporate dome. bullshit, right? So he'll, <laughs> be, he'll be here uh, in about 55 right. minutes. Has anyone else got one? Otherwise, I'm going to start picking on a few people. Yes. Oh, down yes. Here. Uh, down here. Welcome. You can join. I need no, he's only if you're well connected. Want. Sorry, what? <laughs> A web developer. A web developer. Oh, developer. Is there any web developers anyone in the room? Anyone there a web developer? There we go. We've got a few web developers here. Hey. Hiya. There we go. There you go. You've got a few. What type of web? What, what, just the normal well, website, like, mobile. Yeah, like a fashion website. So something to create something like. ASOS. Lots of colours. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Cool. Remember okay. Then let's see. Let's see if we get some names. Does anyone actually have specifically somebody they want to meet? Like, uh, go on then. Nick Hayward, who's Nick. the head of marketing for Razor UK. Uh, like, do I know him? <laughs> Does anyone know Nick Hayward? Is Nick Hayward here? <laughs> Nick? <laughs> We've got a Nick Hayward in the house. Is he about to call Annie? <laughs> oh, that might be tough. I, I could have a Sorry. look on LinkedIn. Anyone um, can link, look on LinkedIn, work out where he is. I always find Twitter really good just to annoy yeah. people. Yeah. Just like, just at them and just be like, hey, yeah. hey, help me. Hey, what's up? Hey. You came up in a talk hey. we were at today. Yeah. We all think you're awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any, anybody else that's got somebody we might have heard of? No, no. Yes. <laughs> We're here to help you guys. <laughs> can I can I uh, do it the other way around and offer help? Oh yes. Yeah. What a man. <laughs> <laughs> so I run a PR agency that works specifically with startups and young technology companies over in East London. I mentor for Seed Camp, Bethnal Green Ventures, Oats Partners on Twitter. If anyone wants some pro bono PR assistance. Does it have to be for social ventures? No. Lesbian ventures, fine? Definitely not. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Lesbian I'm in. The more cutting edge capitalist, the better. <laughs> Do you want to just say your Twitter handle again so people can yeah. spam you properly? So that's Oats Partners, and that's O A T E S Partners. This is the music this of is the success. Epic music. This is the music of success. Building up. <laughs> <sighs> Connections are built. Are you writing that down? You're like, I can go to hit that up later. <laughs> yeah, I, I want PR some help. free PR. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. We will leave it there. But it's uh, as, as a kind of a... Like a is that as it? A is it? We finished that. That was poor. No, we've got and no more t-shirt. Oh, right. Where's the t-shirts? Where's the t-shirts? Come on. And uh, the place T-shirts, right. Well, to the guy that offered his help up. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a t-shirt. You get a t-shirt. Ta-da! Um, and, uh, oh, I would give one to Annie because she actually is bringing someone over here. But she's well, Annie works one. at Wyra, yeah. so <laughs> it doesn't really work. Could you just ask one question? Oh, you get one because you're about to find a web developer. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> to advise you, not necessarily to build it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as a technique, like, it's always a really a good idea to have that list to hand, to know who the top five people are that you're looking to meet. And every single person that you meet, like, uh, pick the one person that you think they might know because you will be completely surprised like uh, who that might be able to introduce you to and always ask like if you don't ask you don't get so just always always ask it's always amazing as well you can you can often think that some people are just you you're out of your league you're never going to meet them but if you stalk them long enough you <laughs> will meet them though and harass them on twitter obviously use like social media it's amazing the fact that you can um are you wanting to chip in here is that all right yeah go for it <laughs> cool so um we have wire ac two wire academies in London now. We have one which these guys are part of, which uh, there's 17 of you in there yep. now. 
17 guys 16, off. they got rid of a shit one. No, there's still 17. <laughs> Come on. There should be less. Honestly. <laughs> These so guys are taking the space. <laughs> 17 of the startups in the London Academy, and we've built another academy, which actually also is um, focused purely on socially responsible businesses. Um, they start on Monday. There's 10 of them, so we'll have 27 startups all in the same space. They start on Monday? Yeah. That building's definitely not finished. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them that. All right, yeah. <laughs> it's be a lot I left the office and there was like <laughs> dust everywhere. It's going to be a lot of work over the weekend, Rich. Ten so we <laughs> held a pitch competition for those 10 startups and I wanted to pick who, who would be my number one person that I would want them to, co would, would I want to come along, inspire the guys to keep plugging away, keep doing their idea. What's that one socially responsible entrepreneur? And I went, I would love to get the guys and the co-founders of Gandhi's Flip Flops. If you've never heard of Gandhi's, go and have a look at them online. They look like that. Um, but basically, this startup was born out of complete tragedy. Uh, the young lads who run the business, they lost their parents. Hey, Jose Maria, give us a wave. Hi. It's the wire stage. <laughs> Um, that's just the global CEO of Telefonica there. Um, anyway, <laughs> Gandhi's flip-flops. Started by two brothers who actually lost their parents um, who died in the tsunami, the Boxing Day tsunami 10 years ago. Their parents had a really strong social purpose of wanting to be able to do something that made a difference. So they instilled that belief in their children and basically they wanted to create a business that would actually contribute back to society Every single pair of flip-flops they sell, 10% of the profits go into building schools and um, orphanages across Sri Lanka, India, and all of those other places that were hit by the tsunami. And I thought, what a bloody brilliant story to inspire people to keep working on their idea and not stop at anything. What did I do? I stalked them on Twitter. <laughs> I stalked them a lot. I kept saying, you should definitely come and speak at this event. And it happened. It, number one, persistence. Number two, aim high. Number three, guess what? If you ask, he did that. The co-founders came along and spoke for free. I didn't have to pay anything because he was so happy to contribute back and help. So ask for help. Don't be shy. Good story. Okay. Makes me so proud. Makes me so proud. <laughs> Learning from the best. Yeah. Good. So uh, <laughs> don't shout at your employees. No, wait, that's not what we're saying here. Uh, so this was more about actually, so you can have, bit, you can have advisors in business and, and actually sort of align to the work that you're specifically doing. But often it's really good to have advisors that are just generally good people to look out for you personally. Um, I've got probably two or three people that have followed me uh, and, and who have advised me kind of since I was probably 14 or 15 years old um, that have, have really been great people to sort of lean on in, in like sort of when I've had to make tough decisions. So having really a sort of a solid team around you uh, that will kind of help you in terms of your, your, your personal life, in terms of your work life, um, and just generally point you in the right direction and sort of open doors for you um, can be really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, the the yeah. personal ones can be more important because... Uh, that your business needs will change um, and your whole business might change. So having people that you're going to stay in touch with throughout your whole like, kind of career is really and important. I just want to kind of add, especially if you're someone who likes throwing up businesses and failure and, and sort of not achieving very much, having a mentor, just having one person who is your sort of trusted business ally who you can go to when you're in tears, when you've bankrupted yourself, when you've unable to pay your staff is really, really useful just because they have been there, they've been through it, and it makes you realize you're not alone. Sometimes having advisors can be very, very useful for business, but you can be a bit afraid to maybe go and talk to them about the actual problems you're facing. Yeah. So if you don't have a mentor, do try and find a mentor as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, and I think you back. just brought up a very good point there is the fact that you want to find somebody that you actually can trust and go to when the times are really shit. And that's more important than going to them with being very proud as an entrepreneur, and that's the thing, as entrepreneurs, you're very, is, being proud is a, is a pretty big trait, and it's really tough to go to somebody when you have to put on your happy PR face to everybody else and say, oh, things are going really, really well. We're just raising funding, and when you know that absolutely no one's going to invest in you. <laughs> you. You need an advisor that you can go to and sort of cut out the bullshit and, and really sort of get to the bottom of it, and that's, and that's, uh, that's probably m most important for, the, yeah. for me anyway. Um, just a really like a small practical thing. Once you have the advisors, keep them in the loop. So uh, 
it's a great idea to kind of send a weekly, maybe too much, depending on their role. It might just be like a monthly email that you send to your list of people that just tells them what's going on in the business. So what's happened in the past couple of weeks or month? What's the biggest like problem that you're facing in the business at the moment? And who are you looking to meet? So your investors need to know, uh, your advisors need to know what's happening so that if they meet someone, you're at front of mind and they're like, oh yeah, well, those guys are really looking to meet someone that can do this. And if they know what's going on in the business, they can find the right people to help you and advise you. And they can also chip in with anything that they've come across. And it also means that when you're meeting up with them, you're probably going to get like a, an hour to two hours of their time. It means you don't waste the first half hour being like, so this is what's happened in the past like four weeks since we last met. Um, and we kind of like uh, covered it earlier, but your business will change, like what you need will change. The, the five things that you wrote down that you need help with, like hopefully you'll find those people and you'll sort out those problems and then you'll start looking for new people to address new problems. So make sure you uh, find great new people all the time. Everyone that you meet, think of as like as a potential advisor because they're gonna have a skill set that might be relevant to you. And don't be afraid to ditch your advisors. Like. Uh, at the moment, so I didn't have a huge product background, so I've got three product advisors helping me at the moment. But in like a, a few months' time, it probably won't be necessary to have three people helping me in that specific area. I'll probably need more marketing and growth help. So don't be afraid to say to them, "Hey, thank you so much. Like I'll always keep you like updated with what's going on." But maybe it's not right for you to have such a kind of a direct involvement in the business anymore. Who wants Robin to be her, their advisor? No, no time. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I've got you some gigs. <laughs> I won't even bother asking. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our concluding slide. <laughs> your team is your startup. Do you know really who said that? A really insightful slide. Who said that? <laughs> that tells you. Miley Cyrus. Yeah, Miley Cyrus. <laughs> Miley Cyrus. <laughs> she said that. I heard it. Yeah, she's a role model in the yeah. scene. Pardon? Yeah. Mid yeah, twerk. Mid twerk. If you didn't she see her at the yeah, VMAs, that's what she said. <laughs> but it's the most important thing. You could, you can pretty much fuck up everything else, and if you get that bit yeah. right, you're probably about fifty or sixty percent of the way there. And it's the other thing. It's kind of like your product will change, your marketing will change, your your idea will change. But if you've got a good team, and 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 it's not just coincidence that's why investors will invest in good teams is because everything else can go tits up but if you've got a solid team and you work well together that's the main thing um, and the most valuable thing as well yeah, there's a reason that all investors are all kind of like a guides that every book that you'll read will say that everyone invests in teams and it's because it's true and uh, I've definitely learned it a very hard way that if I started off with that kind of core three team structure it would have made things a lot easier you can make things work in other ways but getting the good team around you is going to be the thing that makes your business successful cool and then if you've yeah. got any other questions ask us on Twitter in 140 characters or <laughs> if, it, if it's longer we're going to do a Q&A session now we've got oh, some time you've got, you got 15 minutes <laughs> to basically minutes. put your questions of which there are many questions I think just before we have questions can everyone just remember the three core H words that, that make up team mm. fit and I'd quite like to shout them if you can remember what they are so we had we we've had one do you remember the what? first yeah. one Hacker no, stop it. Oh, sorry, what was the second one <laughs> Like you care? Like you really care? It's better. Uh, and finally, well, Anne, Anne cares so, at least. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So that was, that was excellent, excellent <laughs> participation, everybody. So yeah, we're going to open up the floor. If anybody has any questions on anything to do with startups, startup life, kind of what we do with our spare time, we do nothing because we work on our startups the whole time. Yes, sir. What's your Hi. name? Where do you come from? I'm David. I'm from Germany. Cool. And I'm going to uh, develop a startup in, in a few months and my question is regarding to culture did you have your culture from the beginning or did you develop it I think it's one of those things that it is it, it's, it's you can't really force it and I think you there's lots of people that I've seen that have tried to force a culture and be like I like that company's culture we're gonna try and do that Mike, and yeah. sometimes it just doesn't work very well um, with what they're doing it's got no culture is going to be exactly the same, and I don't think you can copy other companies as well. Um, I think you've got to look at well, what are your core values for the business? Where do you want to see your business sort of positioned in the future? Not just from an internal perspective of where the employees feel that you are, but also from potentially future employees, your customers, and everybody else actually looking down on you. Um, so it's one of those things. I, do, I, I think to begin with, you have a, an idea of what the culture will be, but you've got to sort of, as any kind of position in a startup, you've got to adapt and you've got to progress it um, as it grows. And as you grow as a team, your culture will change as well. 
I so, kind of personally think like in a startup, your culture is you. It's probably going to be a team of like two or three people. So it's probably just going to be what you guys like to do. Um, and you, you can't force it. You can't work out like, hey, that sounded cool. So maybe we could do it. It's got to be things that you like doing, but you can think about it a little bit and just make sure you kind of regularly do stuff. And as your team gets bigger, it does get more important to guide it a bit and make sure that those things are still there. Um, but it's just going to be, it's going to be you guys and what you like doing. That's why we bake and eat sweets. Peter Nixie, you have the stage. Um, do you mind if I make a quick um, observation? Can I um, Go pass for on it. an anecdote? So, Come up the front. Come up the front. Yeah. Go on. Come Peter up Nixie. the front. <laughs> there we go. Welcome. Um, so when you guys were talking about um, building teams and, and bringing people on board and recruiting them and so on, there's, there's one thing that I've learned over a couple of companies that I've done. I have just effectively split test it. And when you start a company, especially when you start a startup, you're kind of a bit terrified when you're running it because you don't know whether or not it's going to succeed. And you kind of hope that nobody else is going to figure out that you don't know whether or not the thing's going to succeed. And you don't entirely know what you're supposed to do next while you're doing this whole thing. And so there's a huge temptation when somebody comes on board and it's a huge thing for I feel for somebody to say that they're going to work with you I mean it's a huge responsibility that you take on and when they do that there's I think a lot of pressure on you as a founder and as an employer to deliver to that person and having split test two different ways to do it I can say that there is one very bad way to do this and one very good way to do this and Kind of was this intentional split this. testing or accidental split this testing? This was accidental split okay. testing. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> classic I'm going to do this really fucking badly to see what happens and do a quote <laughs> yeah, and see if it's better. No, I wish, I wish it had been that calculated. It was just I was a rubbish boss and then I was quite a yeah. good boss. Um, the really bad way to do it is kind of the natural fearful way to do it, which is to try and hoard information and to expect your employees to prove to you that they're worth you paying them. So... The first company I did, I actually had two amazing people come on board. They've since gone on to do huge things. But I kind of kept information from them, and I also kind of expected them to prove to me that they were working all the time. And that really kind of isolated me from them, and it created a nasty working environment. And since then, over the different companies that I've done, and kind of with the last one, I've gone to completely the other end of things, where when somebody comes on board, in effect, I really try and do as much as I can for them. So I try and teach them and I kind of, I help them out with the things they're doing and I try to make sure that the company's letting them operate in the way they want to. But I really kind of, in whatever way I can, whether it's teaching them how to code or teaching them something else they don't know, um, I'll try and give to them. And we also have done in this company, and in fact our product is about this complete transparency and everything. So we've gone from hoarding information to letting everybody know everything, the state of the funding, the state of the design, the state of everything else. And just as an anecdote for all of you to kind of take away as you want, between those two companies, I know the people in this company would just walk on water to make this company succeed. And the people in the other company didn't really like being a part of it. So kind of, and ask not what your employee can do for you, but what your you can do for your employee mentality will really create a huge amount of loyalty from them to you. I think, I think that's quickly to pick up on that, the whole transparency thing. Because that's, as a, from a founder's point of view, that's quite a, a hard thing to sort of it's open scary up to. Yeah. yeah. If you're yeah. just basically telling anyone. I even know that some companies uh, actually share the salaries in the team. And they actually sort of uh, also let the team determine the salaries. How did you sort of make that step? And what were your main concerns when doing so? Like, to open things up? It like was, uh, if, does anyone, is anyone here familiar with Stripe's email policy? Yeah. Anyone else? No. <laughs> it so sounds like a pain in the ass, <laughs> to be honest, when I look at it. I don't know enough about it, but to get... Uh, go on, you explain it, yeah. Well, Stripe have an email policy, and essentially kind of our software was doing this. Almost all of the emails in their company are public, and they're all kind of filtered, and they're through different lists. But essentially, everything is searchable and available to everyone. A lot of stuff is actually literally sent to everyone. Even things that are direct person-to-person -person go in full visibility of everyone else. And so we did this, and our software was doing this, and we did this from the start. And... I think it's actually, it's something that is, it's, it's quite easy to do if you do it from the start. As soon as you don't, the start building up pressure points and knowledge reservoirs and so on in the company, which are difficult to break down. And by the time the company gets the size of something like O2, people's entire jobs depend on hoarding information. But if you can do it from the start, I think 
it's, it's fairly straightforward. Our investors saw everything that we did. They saw all of our discussions. Our employees saw our investor updates. Literally everything was transparent. And it, it meant the other huge thing that it did is that it meant when we switched direction, which you have to do a lot as a, as a startup, if you're sharing everything, and especially if you're sharing your customer development stuff with everybody and sending around to everybody, everybody knows why you're changing direction. And they understand that it wasn't resonating with the customer. And so there's never any kind of backlash when you say, so everyone, we've got to like stop trundling down the line. We've all been powering down to date and we've got to switch over here. Because they know, they've seen that people said they wanted that and they didn't want this. Behaving like that is like a huge culture thing. It's like a massive, massive trust. Like you're basically saying to every single person in the company, I trust you with everything that's like important to this. It, it is huge. And it's a thing actually, Facebook, it's interestingly, both Facebook and Google are very, very big on this. In, until very recently, I think Google Docs within Google, it wasn't possible to have private documents. Like anyone in the company could access anyone else's documents. And in Facebook, almost, I think, most of their stats and so on are available internally. It's very empowering to people if you can do it. Yeah. Top tip. Five minutes. Okay. So we've got time for a couple of questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on share options for early employees. Have you used it? Do you think it's worth it? Um, I'll go quickly. No, I haven't yet. Uh, because it's fairly expensive to set up if you're kind of doing it officially and properly. You can kind of make commitments of options to go out, which Rich might have done. Uh, what, what? Share options. Yeah, I, but in terms of, I, I think, I think typically when... It varies, but I, so for example, for delivery, we set up a, at the very beginning, um, we set up the option scheme. So founders had 85% and then we allocated 15% to, uh, to options. Um, Is that as like an ESOP? Uh, it was EMI option scheme. Okay. Yeah. So you have to write to the government and it, you, if you're, uh, so other stuff, if you Google EMI option scheme, you get, the employees get certain taxable benefits of get, receiving them as a full-time employee. Um, I, I very much think they're a great thing to do. It's a, it's a very good th way to align people. Same with, uh, obviously, founder vesting. Make okay. sure you reward them over a period of time um, and, and that they, um, there are certain rules in place. So if they leave, uh, they have to sort of uh, exercise them within a certain amount of time. Or if they're a bad lever, they don't even get to exercise them at all, that kind of thing. I wanted to ask. Um, I wanted to ask, how did you go about finding and approaching your advisors? Uh, harassment, um, uh, <laughs> Twitter. Uh, like, most people that I met was actually face to face. I went to an event where they would be talking or where they would be doing something and I would literally go straight up to them afterwards and be like, this is amazing. I think you can make a really great difference in my business. Can I meet you for coffee? Um, use LinkedIn, see if there's anyone that you know that knows them and ask them for an intro. If you're going cold, then you do have to kind of go for the harassment approach in a friendly way. Uh, ideally, find someone that knows them that you can see in similar circles on the. How do you find them first of all, as well? Like, if t in terms see of say, they're talking. Yeah. We'll say, say, we'll say you just say you want somebody in like marketing or whatever. Yeah. Uh, how do think you? Do that? So I always found like the people that I respected the most, or people that are, like do aim high, as Annie said. Like, think are the best people that you can think of that do that. Maybe work out a couple of levels below that as well, but find out like. This is weird, but I really want Mary Portis to advise us in our business. And uh, I found out where she lives and where the coffee shops are near her house. So should I walk past and she's there, then that's where I can be like, hey, funny thing that you might want to hear about is I run a business that does this. But work out how to, like, where they'll be. Uh, here's a good plug for Wara in terms of actually since this is one of the benefits. I've done two companies outside of Wara, one in Wara. The one of the biggest things is the network that they have. So being out, I mean, we have this whole day yeah. of mentors. And to be honest, out of the four that we've got, three came through, through wire introdu introductions or people that just came by and ended up speaking to. Um, so uh, yeah, that was a really good way of doing it. We'll do one more question and I think we're gonna have to call it done. Okay, I'm sorry. Ooh. Sir, who's dressed the same as the man behind him? <laughs> Hi. Um, being a non-techie, uh, I'm trying to build an MVP. Should I outsource it or should I look to try and take on a technical co-founder? Is it a web MVP or is it a mobile? Web. Build it yourself. 
I would say learn to build it. And it sounds scary. And I know you probably really want to do your idea as quickly as possible. But if it's web, you can learn to program web. Like I did a 10 week course. Um, it cost me, I think it was like 1500 quid. Um, and I would happily build an MVP afterwards. And as part of it, you can like stay friends with the tutors. Um, they'll probably help you with your product. As part of the course, you'll probably build it. And it doesn't mean you're not the person to build it long term, but it means you have something to then go and convince other people to come and work with you. I also think if it's an MVP, you should be able to build it yourself, like whatever it is. And if you can't build it, cut out the bits you can't build. Yeah. And then you'll get to an MVP level where it's, it's good enough to at least start showing people. Cool. Thank you. As, Thank you very much. As a programmer, I really want to do kind of confirm that. Just most of the things that you have ideas about, about MVPs or things, are often just automated email systems that you could use a Google Docs for and a little bit of manual work. I appreciate you may not want to actually do that, but actually most of the time you can bullshit your users that there's loads of clever tech whilst <laughs> we go and build tech and that will work quite well. So, so just to give you a bit of background about what my company does, Delishery, we connect people. <laughs> I, what the, my the company reason, Delishery The reason why does. I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Delishery, it's got my name, my name. No, but the, I'm, I'm saying this because it's actually quite relevant. I'll, I'll do it really quickly because I'm speaking really quickly and we'll just do it. Uh, um, but when we first built Delishery, we essentially allow customers like you to order food from restaurants that don't usually uh, take online ordering. So we've got restaurants here, we've got delivery drivers here that are doing the delivery, and we've got customers. Our first website had no connection with the restaurants or the drivers. We simply took orders from people, and then we actually had to go and go, go down to so the I restaurants. So I could order like a Starbucks and a croissant, and I could see Rich get the email through, and he had to go down to the coffee shop and go and buy me those and bring and come them back. back. But, but to, if she didn't see me doing yeah. that, she wouldn't know. She'd think yeah. this is an amazing system where yeah. Starbucks knew about it and they were going to sit on. Um, so yeah, very much so that's what you should do. Yeah. So thanks, guys. A round of applause for our wonderful speakers. <laughs> Two very quick things. Somebody asked for how do you get, how do you approach um, potential advisors and mentors? Thinking with. Tomorrow afternoon, we're really, really, really lucky. We've got a guy called Ollie Barrett, who if you don't know him, have a look at him on LinkedIn overnight. He runs something called CoSpa, which is basically how to network. It will be genuinely one of the most fun sessions you'll ever hear. I mean, if you've never it's heard really Ollie speak, he's brilliant fun. But also, you'll walk away from that session with all of the networking skills that you need so that you can land that amazing mentor, that amazing board advisor. Second thing is just to remind you that we do have these sessions for the whole of the rest of this week, every morning from 10 until 12, 2 until 4. All of these sessions are about building your idea into a, a potential startup that you could apply to an accelerator. On Friday afternoon, we've got ourselves, Techstars and Seed Camp all on stage so you can ask us any questions you want. Lots of thumbs up from Ben there. Um, Ben's going to be with us all week as well. So basically, we're here to help you get your idea to that position where you could genuinely apply it to a startup program. And as Ben said, right at the start of this session, for the, the startup that comes to all of our sessions and that really engages with us, we are going to put them through to the semi-finals of the WIRA program to get selected. So not a bad um, incentive for you to keep coming back. So I will leave it there because I think the, uh, the main stage will be back online again in a few minutes. Thank you so much for coming. We hopefully see you again the rest of this week.